Okay, I'm going to introduce Marcy. Um, our presentation today, as you know, is Living History at Oakland Cemetery by Education Manager of the Historic Oakland Foundation, Marcy Breffel. Marcy has an absolutely fascinating job. <laughs> she oversees all educational programming at Historic Oakland Cemetery, developing programs for visitors of all ages and backgrounds that explore a range of topics and issues. Oakland Cemetery is a 48 acre community park, an outdoor gallery of funerary art and the final resting place for 70,000 people. Wow. That's that amazing. <laughs> so that, a multifaceted space with multiple connection points for thousands of visitors. I know many of you have been part of that. Since coming to work at Oakland in 2015, she has developed a number of programs to expand Oakland's reach into the Atlanta community, including an annual Juneteenth celebration, photography workshops, a homeschool program, and after our thematic tours. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> Marcy studied history at the University of Georgia with art mm -hmm. and received a graduate degree in public history from Georgia State University. Please welcome Marcy. Thank you. No All right, Penny, thank you so much. Y'all, it's such an honor to be here today. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Perfect, wonderful. I can definitely project. Um, I'm so, again, so excited to be here. Again, how many of y'all have been to Oakland before? Oh, oh my goodness, okay, wonderful. Well, um, I hope today that you will um, learn something new and I hope that you will have questions because I love to just talk about the cemetery and of course I hope you'll participate. I am an educator so uh, this is going to be an interactive presentation. I'll be asking questions throughout. A um, little bit of my background so like Pace said I uh, studied history and then went and got my master's in public history at Georgia State. Uh, I did not grow up thinking that I was going to work at a cemetery, so that was not my childhood goal, uh, but did end up at Oakland and, um, you know, it's been a fantastic place to work and um, and just the amount of programming, the stories that I get to tell are it's I just love it. So um, today's presentation is going to be living history at Oakland Cemetery. So I'll talk a little bit about the foundations of Oakland. How did it become the, you know, the way it is today? I'll talk about some of our favorite residents. And yes, we call everybody at Oakland a resident because it is their eternal resting place. And then since we're at the Georgia Archives, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we use uh, um, historic records, photographs to do the research for our programming and interpretation. And then I'll talk a little bit about how you can uh, get involved at Oakland and what are the great things that we have coming up. Um, after the presentation, I've got a number of rat cards up here if you want to come up and grab um, some of those as well as my business card. So we will go ahead and get started. All right. So this is the iconic front gates of Oakland Cemetery. These kids were so excited to be, uh, that we were doing drone footage that day. They were like, are we gonna be on TV? Um, which, well, I guess they're on TV now for y'all. But Oakland was founded in 1850. It's one of the oldest historic sites in the city of Atlanta. Originally, Oakland was six acres. And by 1867, it had reached its present size of 48 acres. So. Like Penny said, we have over 70,000 residents buried in Oakland, and we're still an active burial site with about 15 burials a year. Uh, Oakland is located less, just a few miles from uh, downtown Atlanta. You can see the city skyline in the background, as uh, well as MARTA. You know, people like to think of cemeteries as very peaceful places to be, but between MARTA and downtown Atlanta construction, it can be 
a little difficult to find that peaceful spot at the cemetery, but it is definitely a beautiful place to spend your time. So Oakland is a has many identities. So Oakland is a cemetery. It is a historic space. It is a city park. We are under the Atlanta Parks and Rec Department. It is a wildlife refuge, an arboretum with uh, hundreds of historic trees, some well over a century years year old. And it's an outdoor gallery space. So I am involved with the Georgia Association of Museums, and some people think cemetery, museum, and I tell them, hey, we've got a permanent collection right here of <laughs> Victorian art and architecture. So there's so much to learn there. There's multiple connection points. So whether your focus is history, your focus is art, your focus is the gardens, you're going to find some way to connect to Oakland. Uh, we love to say that once you walk through the front gate, you just fall in love with the space and you want to come back again and again. And I'll tell you later on how you can do that between our tours and special events. Um, this is uh, just scratching the surface, this presentation, because there is so much to learn um, and experience at the cemetery. And <laughs> Chipmunk. I know lots of wildlife at Oakland. All right. So Oakland is what we call a Victorian garden cemetery, which is why, you know, when I tell people where I work, I say, oh, I work at Oakland Cemetery. And most people go, what do you do with this cemetery? I'm going, I'm not digging graves. I'm in charge of education. But so many of us are conditioned to think of cemeteries as just like the flat memorial parks, you know, uh, green lawn, headstones that look exactly alike, and Oakland definitely defies that uh, concept of a cemetery. So in um, the 1700s, prior to like the early 19th century, most cemeteries were either family cemeteries located on rural land, or they were urban burial grounds. Um, urban burial grounds were graveyards and most people think of graveyard and cemetery as an interchangeable term but a graveyard is actually uh, uh, usually attached to a church or a house of worship these buildings being among the most important buildings in a community these were usually located in the center of town which means that any burial ground attached to them already has finite space so not a lot of room to grow this is a burial ground attached to Trinity Church in New York City. I don't know if any of y'all have been to Trinity Church before, uh, but you can see it looks like a beautiful sunny day in New York City, but you can just imagine, do you see how dense the gravestones are in the front? Most people were buried just as they died chronologically. You didn't have families buried together unless they family members died around the same time, um, but these would have not been very fun spaces to spend your time. Kind of like a get in, get out type of cemetery experience. Go in to bury the dead and then leave. Uh, this concept changed in the early 19th century with Père Lachaise. Is anyone familiar with Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris? Have you been there before? Wonderful. It's a it's an incredible space um, and also a free thing to do if you're ever in Paris. So uh, that's that is what hooked me in. But um, Père Lachaise is what we call a garden cemetery. So garden cemetery solved two needs. One, the need for burial space. Two, the need for recreational space. Garden cemeteries were the forerunners to public parks. So before you had Piedmont Park in Atlanta, Grant Park in Atlanta, you had Oakland. Before you had Central Park in New York City, you had some of the cemeteries that were up there. But you can look at this image of Père Lachaise, see these people visiting. We don't know if they're there to visit loved ones who are buried at the cemetery or if they're there to just enjoy the space, find a place of peace, and reflection in what would be a bustling city. And see, this is Père Lachaise now. The uh, city of Paris has grown around it. So, but when you're in Père Lachaise, it still feels 
magical. You're transported almost. It's so quiet and peaceful in this space. So this, uh, I went to Père Lachaise in 2019. It was my last trip before COVID, my last international trip. I dragged my two younger sisters along with me. Um, I said earlier, I did not grow up being a cemetery person, but I am a cemetery person now. Whenever I travel, I always want to see what the local cemetery is and go and visit. It's fun for me. Um, the people that I travel with, not so much. Uh, I spent four hours in a cemetery in Dublin, Ireland called Glasnevin. I think my sister was ready to put me in the ground by the end of that. Uh, she was like, Marcy, let's go, I'm tired. And I was going, oh, they have a museum. Hold on, let's go look at the museum. So, uh, but this is some images of Père Lachaise. You can see uh, the image on the left, the two women, those are my younger sisters, Sarah and Jenny. So did, um, did drag them along, but it's just an incredible space between the mausoleums and the vaults, kind of these winding pathways. And of course, this incredible um, funerary art and architecture. One of my favorite, uh, in, or one of my favorite places to visit in Père Lachaise was this final resting place. Can anyone tell what those marks are on this grave? Lipstick kisses, yes. So this gravesite in Père Lachaise, this is covered in thousands of lipstick kisses, or was up until a couple years ago, but it was seen, this is how people would pay um, respect to the person buried here. They would walk up, pull out a tube of lipstick, put a fresh coat on, just go up, smack, give it a kiss. And this was seen as honoring the person buried here. I will say when I went to go visit, the, um, they had actually, the, whoever the staff at Père Lachaise, they had put up a plexiglass around this monument um, to deter people from, you know, damaging the monument. But that didn't really do anything because the plexiglass was covered in thousands of little lipstick kisses. Um, but this is the final resting place of Oscar Wilde. So if you have a chance again to go, it's I just love this way of um, I love this idea of legacy of how do you honor, you know, the dead and people decide to honor Oscar Wilde by giving giving his gravestone a little kiss. So this idea of the Victorian of the Garden Cemetery jumped the pond. This is Mount Auburn outside of Boston, and Mount Auburn was the first garden cemetery in the United States. And that I think, I think it was about 1830, I want to say, or early 1830s. So this concept made its way down south and um, to Atlanta. So on the left side, you can see a map of Atlanta in 1853, and on the right side, a map of Atlanta today. Well. That little orange circle on the map on the left, that was Oakland, the original six acres of Oakland. So garden cemeteries, again, they were usually um, uh, founded on the outskirts of cities. So these gave the space room to grow, um, you know, to get uh, expand and for more burial ground. And it also kind of eased that stigma of disease associated with cemeteries. And these garden cemeteries, again, taking advantage of the natural landscape. So ponds, other water features, forests, curving hills. Uh, that is what you saw with the um, garden cemeteries. And you can see, of course, Oakland has, or the city of Atlanta has grown around us. So originally on the outskirts, now just a little blip. This is, uh, again, those iconic front gates of Oakland. These were built in 1896. Uh, this is our main entrance to the cemetery, our car entrance. You can see a wagon going into the cemetery. Don't know if they're just there visiting or bringing a, um, someone's remains. Other kind of early images of the cemetery, some of the architecture. Um, can see this one in the pyramid that is the Grant Mausoleum. If anyone here is a Georgia Tech fan, I won't hold it against you, but that is the Grant Mausoleum of Grant Field. So the historic Grant Field at Georgia Tech, um, Bobby Dodd Stadium. Some of the early images of the cemetery, those Victorians were obsessed with um, tropical plants. You would see, has anyone ever been to the Biltmore? Some of those other kind of Victorian 
homes that had the conservatories. Victorians, if you had the money, people would uh, bring in all of these tropical plants, you know, to not only decorate their homes, but also decorate the final resting places of their loved ones. The next couple of slides, these are before and after images. So you can see uh, this is the angle is looking west from Oakland's East Hill area. So back here you can see um, the historic downtown. Uh, this is an image of the African American burial grounds, uh, which we'll get into in just a little bit, but uh, at Oakland, burials were segregated by race from the early 1850s until the 1960s, when all public facilities in Atlanta desegregated. That is um, an area of Oakland's history that we have been exploring um, over the past decade, is looking at Oakland as both a uh, site of social and racial injustice and as a site of um, black achievement and legacy. So this kind of interesting duality that we've been exploring through our programming over the past couple of years. And then again, this is our uh, 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 this is our front gate looking out. I always love this image because it just shows how much Atlanta hates historic buildings. Uh, you can see this image on the top is from a famous funeral in 1949, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but you can see the shotgun houses that are in the back. You can see the stone church that is over there. Today it is a parking lot. Um, I will say it's Oakland's parking lot and we need the we need the space. And in the next couple of years, we are going to be building a brand new visitor center in this space. But as someone who has a historic preservation background, you always hate to see the loss of um, historic buildings. All right, I want to talk about a couple of our residents. So we have what we call the big four at Oakland. So the four most visited residents. Who's this person? Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones is considered the greatest amateur golfer of all time. In 1930, he won the Grand Slam of golf and then promptly retired and became a lawyer. He then later went on to found Augusta National Golf Club where the Masters is played every year. But he was seen um, as a real leader in the early 20s or the first half of the 20th century. Uh, his, he was known for his sportsmanship and character on and off the course. So Bobby Jones, um, he died in the 1970s, came to be buried at Oakland. And this is his gravestone, grave marker. You can see what's what people bring up front. Golf balls, Golf balls exactly. So again, thinking about the way, I mean, I don't know if Bobby Jones wanted to be remembered by golf balls, but this is how we, this is how the public, the community honor Bobby Jones. So it's considered very good luck to bring a golf ball. Um, often, sorry guys, but most of the time it's gentlemen who are out there, they'll place a golf ball on them. You'll see them go, please, Bobby, help me get a hole in one the next time I play or help my golf game. So considered very good luck to leave a golf ball. It's considered very bad luck to take a golf ball. <laughs> and I know I can trust all of y'all because you are adults um, to not take a golf ball. We do have lots of field trips at Oakland and inevitably at the end of a field trip, I'll have a teacher come up to me and go, here you go, Marcy. And it's just like five or six golf balls that <laughs> some kids have picked up. Um, up until a couple years ago, actually, there was a little golf hole right next to his gravesite. So you could, if you brought your putter, you could come up and you could putt one in for Bobby. Um, but just again, this very fascinating way of legacy. How do you want to be remembered 100, 200, 300 years from today? How about this gentleman? Maynard Jackson. So Maynard Jackson uh, was the first black mayor of Atlanta, first black mayor of a major southern city. He served three terms, 1974 to 1982, and then 1990 to 1994. He is known for many different accomplishments. He helped to reform the police department. He helped to make it easier for businesses owned by um, people of color. Uh, and women and other minority groups to get access to city contracts, which were very lucrative and still are pretty lucrative. And uh, he helped to bring the 1996 Olympics to Atlanta. So he uh, died in the early 2000s and he actually, um, 
This is not his original grave marker. He had a very small, probably about knee height, grave marker about just plain stone. It had one of the best epitaphs I've ever seen at the cemetery. And that was a servant devoted to his family and friends and to the politics of inclusion for all Atlantans. I always love that epitaph so much, uh, but he that was placed when he died in 2003 and in 2017, this new monument was placed. Uh, this monument was designed by uh, Maynard Jackson's widow, um, other members of his family and friends, and truly does reflect Maynard Jackson's legacy and what he did for the city of Atlanta. So it's over 14 and a half feet tall. The base is gray Georgia granite. The um, top is African sourced uh, black granite, so reflecting his heritage. And um, there's so much to unpack on it. You really have to see it in person. I don't get to give tours that often anymore because we have so many incredible volunteers who do it. But when I do give a tour, I like to end at Maynard Jackson and I say, okay, I've talked for 75 minutes, now's your turn. You all are gonna become the tour guides. And I let my group walk around Maynard Jackson's headstone and then just observe and then share because there is so much to see in it. Um, I will say what's very interesting, well, one of the interesting things about his gravesite, you can't tell it in this image, but Maynard Jackson is actually buried at an angle. Most graves are either um, oriented on an east-west axis or a north-south axis. He's at an angle. Uh, and how he's placed, if Maynard Jackson were to ever pop up out of the ground, which would be terrifying, um, he would be able to see the city skyline. So, or that was up until last year when an apartment complex was built right outside of Oakland. So, this person. Margaret Mitchell. Margaret Mitchell is the most visited woman at Oakland. So Margaret Mitchell, she was a fourth or fifth generation Atlantan, had grown up hearing stories about the Civil War uh, and Reconstruction from her family members and friends of her family. So she grew up hearing stories from Confederate veterans, from family members who are part of the white planner class, um, uh, from individuals who you know, were successful during uh, before the war, then lost everything um, after the war. And she used these perspectives in her book, Gone with the Wind. So many people like to say, oh, Gone with the Wind is a, is a history of the Civil War. Not true. Gone with the Wind is a perspective of the Civil War. So um, Margaret Mitchell, she uh, wrote this book, won the Pulitzer, published in 1936, went on to win the Pulitzer Prize, and then later became an award-winning film that premiered in Atlanta. This is Margaret Mitchell's final resting place. She was actually out on a date night with her husband in August 1949 when uh, they were going to see a film and they were crossing Peachtree Street when she was hit by um, a car. And she was in a coma for about five days before she died at Grady Hospital. So that image that I showed earlier of the of the the front gate of the funeral, that was Margaret Mitchell's body being brought in by hers. All right, and our most recent resident. <laughs> that's usually the reaction that we get. Uh, who's this person? This is Kenny Rogers, yes. Yeah, so Kenny Rogers, uh, he died in 2020, and they, um, we got the call, or our, my executive director got the call from his estate and said, Kenny Rogers wanted to be buried at Oakland. And I think my, I wasn't on the phone, but from what I've heard, my executive director was going, the, Ke the Kenny Rogers country music award-winning Kenny Rogers roasters, Photographer, the Kenny Rogers, yes. But apparently Kenny Rogers loved historic cemeteries, loved visiting them, and he wanted to be buried in a historic cemetery. So this is his final resting place. Um, he's actually not too far from Bobby Jones. He's just, uh, just east of Bobby Jones. And um, this really incredible vault, which is a very unique design, 
Um, but I learned this. I, I love learning, which is what got me into museums and historic sites in the first place. But I learned uh, I was giving a tour one day talking about Kenny Rogers and I was saying, well, you know, I'm not totally sure what the design concept was, you know, what, what the ideas were behind this rotunda in the vault. And someone on the tour just goes, that's the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville. Has anyone ever been to the Country Music Hall of Fame? Well, now I, now I got to go to the Country Music Hall of Fame, but the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville has a rotunda. On the inside of the rotunda, it says, will the circle be unbroken? Which, can you all see the letters, the words inside? Will the circle be unbroken? So this is Kenny Rogers' final resting place. Um, this is just a map of Oakland and some of the different character areas. This is how we orient ourselves within the cemetery because it is it is easy to get lost in those 48 acres. Um, yes, Cabbage Town. All right, so um, the next part of this presentation, I want to talk a bit about how we do the research and how we use archives, photographs, historic documents to tell the stories of the people buried at Oakland. This right here, this is an abstract. So abstracts are basically just maps of family lots. So uh, like I said, Oakland opened up in 1850 and was divided into blocks, lots. Um, it's divided, well, I'll say it's divided into sections. Within sections, you have blocks. Within blocks, you have lots, and then within lots, you have plots. Start to sound a little bit like Dr. Seuss when I'm explaining this. So uh, like this, would, this is a single plot, but this would be considered a family lot. So this is the Bell family lot. This is located on our East Hill section, and for all of the, we have these historic records. So we can see, looking at, um, looking at when you pull an abstract you can see well who's buried there at what age did they die um when did they die or when were they buried and then we've got a little map so we know that if it's surrounded by if it's number surrounded by a box we know that that's a burial space that there is a remains there but you can see over here 10 and 11 are empty and then over here 10 and 11 are empty so we can match that up um, this stone, this would just be a family stone. So that would say, uh, I think it says Bell or Stevens, because we've got a couple, do we got some in-laws in here as well. Um, but this is how, uh, when we're doing, this is uh, very important for my job, but it's usually more helpful for our preservation team. We have an in-house preservation team. We're one of the few cemeteries across the country that doesn't just have contractors doing our preservation work. But when our preservation team goes into a lot, they will pull the abstract so they know who's buried there. There have been times that our preservation team is literally uncovering history when they're doing this work. They'll start digging down, just they'll have a probe to kind of dig down into the ground a little bit, and they'll hit a gravestone for someone that we don't have the record on them. So they are, um, we have, if you walk through Oakland in some sections, you'll notice a lot of the gravestones are orange, almost up to the top. And that's because they had sunk so far down into the ground that the soil had just um, stained them orange. But this is, the abstracts are very important um, in for multiple departments within Oakland. And I had to cover up some of the contact information up at the top because that shows uh, who the current lot owner is. So if there needs to be work done, we know who to reach out to to say, hey, you've got a tree that's about to fall over. Do you want to help fund this, you know, something like this? Because at Oakland, we have multiple stakeholders. There's the city of Atlanta, the Historic Oakland Foundation, which is the nonprofit I work for, and then we work with descendants to try and take care of the cemetery. But I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So this is what we would call, these are the burial records, or this is a, a little snippet of an Excel spreadsheet. So this is showing some of the members of the Bloomfield family. 
Um, all right, I've got a, another interactive activity. I want you all to find Catherine, Isabella, Anna, and Bridget and tell me something about them. Tell me what they have in common besides their family. Catherine, Isabella, Anna, and Bridget. They all died in the same year. They all died in the same month. They all died within 10 days of each other. These were four sisters, ages two, four, six, and eight, who died in January 1863 from diphtheria. Diphtheria is a highly contagious upper respiratory infection. Luckily, now we've got vaccines that, you know, don't make diphtheria an issue anymore for us. But you can think about in the 1860s, these were four little girls, probably all sharing definitely sharing a room, likely all sharing one bed or two beds, and any sickness that one caught was likely going to get passed to the other. Um, so this is the Bloomfield girls are on our uh, one of our general tours, the site symbols and stories tour, and we just talk about um, how fragile life was in the 19th century. I mean, you think about the state of medicine in the 19th century, it's awful, you know? No real idea of germ theory, kind of like cut first, ask questions later type concept. Um, but we can see, you know, just just how fragile life was, especially for those who were under the age of 18. But you can see other members of the family. So it goes last name, first name, date of death, age, and then this these last four columns. This just shows the location of where they're buried at Oakland. Sometimes we don't have the location information um, at Oakland. So many times if you go, you, you can go to Oakland and go when our visitor center's open, you can say, can I see the records? And our volunteer there will pull out a couple binders and you can start looking through some of the names. Oftentimes you'll see where it says unassigned or there just won't be a burial location. And uh, this is uh, it's pretty frequent. Um, but in this case, this is an image of Potter's Field. Anyone want to guess how many people are buried in Potter's Field? 10,000? Okay, very close. 7,500 people buried in Potter's Field. And this is a place where people love to picnic. They love to take their dogs out on walks. Um, it really does look like a beautiful park space, but there's about 7,500 people buried there without headstones. So these are oftentimes people who couldn't afford a headstone or after all of Oakland's lots sold out, they you know, ended up getting buried in Potter's Field. Um, all right. This is another example of burial records. This is the first page of the Slave Square burial records. So like I said, Oakland's, Oakland was segregated by race from the early 1850s until the 1960s. Uh, in Slave Square, this was a section of the original six acres that was set aside for the burial of free and enslaved Black Atlantans. Um, and from, Started, the first burial was in uh, February 1853, and by the start of the Civil War, you had over 800 men, women, and children buried in Slave Square. Now, Slave Square, the story doesn't end there. Um, when, in 1877, federal reconstruction is over, uh, white Southern men are back in charge of the uh, Atlanta government, and someone started looking at Slave Square. They realized that Slave Square, you know, in the original six acres had been on the northeast corner. As Oakland expanded, Slave Square then sat in the center of the cemetery. It was also located on a hill. If you ever go to a cemetery, look for the hill. That's usually where the most prominent people are going to be buried, you know, because you have to look up to see them. Um, but the Atlanta City Council said, hey, for lack of a better term, this is prime burial real estate. So in 1877, a resolution was passed that said, um, everyone buried in Slave Square is going to be dug up, disinterred, and reburied in what was called the colored pauper grounds. So um, just as individuals were discriminated against in life and dehumanized in life, they were also dehumanized in death. So almost all of the people buried in Slave Square were just dug up, reburied without headstones. So in this case, 
the only thing that we have left are the burial records. This is it. This is the history. These are the names of the individuals. And what part of my job is to make sure that we are remembering that history, that we are not shying away from Oakland's, you know, the past of his racial and social injustice. But I want to talk about one individual in particular. This is the very first person buried in Slave Square. This was a 14 year old boy named John. He died on February 10th, 1853. So 14 years old, he was born in Fayette County, Georgia. He died from complicated diseases. And we know that this was his burial space. So the grave and row of his, uh, where he was buried. Back to the previous screen. Mm -hmm. Did I see that one person, instead of having Negro, Beside their name, it says Creek. Am I nuts? Where, where do you see it? It's on the, it's on the left side. I'll have to look a little more closely <laughs> at it, but that, yes. October the 7th, 25. I can't read the name. Dickerson, maybe Creek. Hmm. Many years. Six years. October 1. That might be a first name with most of these burials. You'll see, and I'll show you John's burial record. So you can see at the top, well, under name, you see John, but you see W.M. Herring. That's William Herring. He was, uh, he enslaved John. So in most of these cases with the slave square burial records, you'll see the, you'll see the name of the enslaver and then you'll see maybe a first name for the actual person buried there. And then most of the time you'll just see the word Negro or just even an N. So, oh. so again, and combing through them, you are going to recognize a lot of early Atlanta families. A lot of those pioneers who were, the stories that we've heard over the years is that they just pulled themselves up from their bootstraps. But we know that many of these individuals relied on enslaved labor to become successful. Um, so complicating that narrative of those early pioneers in Atlanta. Uh, this is a current project of mine is to get all of the slave square records into a database that you can then search through. So we've got all the records digitized and now it's a matter of getting into a database where you can start looking. We're seeing that this is not only going to be great for genealogical studies, but also like population studies. So a tool that students can use because you're looking at death dates, you're looking at the ways people died, you're looking at where they were born. Um, but this is again how we're using the records at Oakland. One particular, this story of Slave Square, which we've been telling um, through different, we've been telling it on tours, we have interpretive panels. Um, this also inspired a project that I got to work on. It was a three year project um, with an artist, Charmaine Minifield. And Charmaine, um, incredibly talented artist, but she was inspired by the story of the residents of Slave Square, the over 800 men, women, and children who were disinterred and reburied in the colored pauper grounds. And so I worked with her to have a temporary site-specific art installation placed in the African-American burial grounds. So this is, uh, uh, if you're not familiar with a praise house, a praise house was a structure used by enslaved men and women as a place of worship, as a place for community, for social gathering. Uh, most of the times, you'd have individuals kind of go inside the praise house and use their voices, their bodies to worship together, to beat out a song, a rhythm. Um, and this incredible art installation that we, it was up for three weeks last summer, but you could come up and then go inside and just immerse yourself in the um, in images and videos and the song of uh, the ring shout, which is a um, type of worship. Um, but this was an incredible project that I got to work on and uh, we won a Best of Atlanta award uh, last year. But And actually this praise house, if you are interested, it's gonna be at Emory and then later we'll be at Southview Cemetery in the next couple of years. So Oakland was the very first um, praise house project, but we're going to have more of them over the next few years. All right. Ooh. Um, 
So in another set of records, these are not burial records, these are work records. So this shows a list of the employees at Oakland, their age and their term of service. You can also see how much they made per day. So there's various individuals with different positions, you know, bricklayer, florist, maid, foreman, kind of their different ages. You can see their different uh, rates of service. So this particular um, document, this was brought to my attention by our director of preservation. Her name is Ashley Shares. And a couple years ago, she got it into her head that she was going to um, create, develop this whole campaign to get one of our buildings in Oakland restored. And this building was the Women's Comfort Station, which I'll show you an image. So the Women's Comfort Station was a restroom. You know, as Oakland grew, as you had more people visiting, of course, you need somewhere to go to the bathroom. And I mean, ladies, you think about what women were wearing in the 1800s, 1900s. It was a lot of layers <laughs> and that may be OK in the middle of winter, but in the middle of summer, not so much. Um, so these were also places where women could go and like loosen the corset strings a little bit, maybe get a breather. But this really incredible building, it was falling into disrepair. So Ashley uh, fundraised and was or led fundraising on this to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, renovate this space. It's not a bathroom anymore, but it is a temporary exhibit space. Now, when we were talking about interpretation, Ashley shared, she goes, well, you know about Ida Borders, don't you? Ida Borders. Ooh. Um, but Ida Borders was, you can see her, she is the second from the last line, but Ida Borders um, was an early female employee at Oakland. She was one of the few African-American employees at the cemetery, and she worked in a variety of positions, um, but one of those positions was to work as an attendant at the Women's Comfort Station. So you can see, according to these records, um, she's 44 years old. She's been working at Oakland for five years and she's getting paid a dollar a day. Um, and that is or a dollar and then comparison to her male counterparts who are making 250. Um, but we can just learn so much from the different burial records. And we've used her story. This is an interpretive panel that is outside of the women's comfort station that talks about not only the building itself, but looking at the story of working at Oakland. All right. Um, this is not a document. This is not a photograph, but it is something that I find to be really fascinating thinking about the workers of Oakland. The next time you're at the cemetery, I want you to look down. I want you to watch where you're walking because again a historic site i don't want anyone taking a tumble but look down and you'll notice on the bricks fingerprints fingerprints of the people who made the bricks at oakland so this is um something that we're just starting to get into at the cemetery but talking about the workers of oakland their impact on the landscape because just as important of the stories of residents is the stories of the people who worked at Oakland, the gardeners, the grave diggers, the uh, night guards, the people who shaped the landscape. And it's been fascinating. I've been retraining some of our tour guides and we're going around and I've spent half my time just kind of like crawling around on the brick going, look here, like you can see four finger, you know, this one's so good. Um, but I, I find that to be fascinating. So, um, I want to talk quickly just about photographs and actually I'll tell you um Penny I was looking at this image because I think this might be an image taken by this man this is Thomas Askew Thomas Askew was a pioneer photographer in Atlanta um but he was known for taking images of black life at you know the last um you know quarter of the 19th century but that's a self-portrait on the left over here, this amazing looking woman. This is a nurse. I, we don't know what her name was, but she was a nurse. She looks like an opera star to me. She looks incredible. Um, yep, same, different picture, but same background. So 
So this is an image that Thomas Askey took. This is the Summit Street Ensemble, and five of the six men here were Thomas Askew's sons. Took images of colleges in Atlanta. This is the Morris Brown baseball team. All right. But all of these images were used to inspire one of our, our more recent special events at Oakland. So we do a number of different special events. This was a Lumen. This is in a year, our kind of spring art event, but part of a Lumen, it was um, showcased as an enlightened after hours art experience at Oakland. But part of it was taking some of the images of Thomas, taken by Thomas Askew, blowing them up and having them lit from behind. It's a really beautiful event. Um, but it was a way to experience Oakland at night, which normally our gates close and lock at sunset. So you don't normally get to come into Oakland at night, but again, very kind of cool space that people could come in and experience. And part of this was inspired by Thomas Askew's photos. So some of his photos were actually displayed in Paris in 1900 at the Paris Exposition, kind of the World's Fair, in an exhibit curated by W.E.B. Du Bois. And um, so there, a lot of the photos ended up there. And actually, Thomas Askew, um, his home and his studio were destroyed in the Great Atlanta Fire of 1917. So a lot of that, those images, those negatives have been lost to history, but we do have many of them. Um, I think the ones I just showed you were on the Library of Congress website. This is another different type of document. So over here on the right, this is James Tate. So James Tate um, was um, an early pioneer of Atlanta's Black community. He opened up the first Black-owned business in Atlanta after the Civil War, a grocery store, and then he later um, became involved in starting up some of the churches and schools, and he used his money made from his business and other ventures to then, you know, pay it forward. So he helped to uh, fund other black entrepreneurs in Atlanta. He is known as the father of black business in the city. But this image on the left, this um, is something that our director of special events uncovered a couple years ago. She found this in a book, but this is an, a letter written from James Tate to his wife, Olivia in 1863. So James Tate and his wife, Olivia were both enslaved. They were enslaved on different plantations. And James Tate uh, knew how to read and write and was able to communicate at great risk to himself to his wife, Olivia. So um, Olivia was living, was enslaved on one plantation with their two children, Jimmy and Mary Olivia, and James was able to communicate to her. Um, but he wrote her these letters that basically said they're love letters to each other saying that we're apart, but, you know, there will be no other woman for me. I will find you later. We will be together again. Just, um, I think of this last line, for I cannot think of any other woman nor love any other but you, my dear wife. Beautiful, beautiful letter. Our director of special events found this a couple years ago, and she used this letter to inspire are one of our Capturing the Spirit of Oakland Halloween tours. Has anyone ever been on a Halloween tour at Oakland? <laughs> Besides Jamie. Um, so this is our Capturing the Spirit of Oakland. This is our biggest event of the year. Usually the last two weekends in October, we have, we're doing eight nights of it this year, but we bring to life six to eight residents of the cemetery. Their stories change every single year. So, I mean, 70,000 people, that's over 70,000 stories to tell. And last year, one of, or two of the residents that we decided to portray were James Tate and his wife, Olivia. So these two actors in kind of first person character talk about their story. They talk about their love for one another. They talk about how they were separated and then what happened after the war when they were reunited and came up in Atlanta. Y'all, people were crying during, we want people to laugh and we want people to go like, oh my goodness. And like, we're leaving this and everyone's like, oh my gosh. Um, this most incredible, amazing story. Um, and I will say, 
one of his descendants is a man named Ernest Tate, who's on our board. And Ernest Tate, or one of their descendants, Ernest Tate brought his whole family to these Capturing the Spirit of Oakland tours. They were in the group behind me. I was really mad because I wanted to walk them around. Um, but the whole family, can you just imagine that? That you were on this tour hearing the stories of your ancestors brought to life in a very emotional, compelling way. I, I cannot imagine. It was It's an amazing thing to behold, but uh, definitely one of my favorite stories from the past couple of years. All right, and the last thing I want to talk about, just thinking about archives, et cetera, um, is not only physical archives, but also oral histories. I will say I did not take an oral history class when I was in grad school, and I really wish I had because it would have become very helpful. Um, but this is the final resting place of George Howie Prince. Now, George Howie Prince died in 1997, and we didn't really know too much about him, but we knew that every couple of weeks, someone came and brought flowers to his grave site. We found out later, because our one of our gardeners started talking to her, that this was Howie's mom. And Howie's mom would come and bring flowers to her grave every year. And our gardener, he uh, emailed me and he goes, Marcy, you have to talk to this woman. Here's her phone number, call her. So I called her. We talked over two sessions, about four hours on the phone. And she told me everything about her son. And she was just so excited to be able to have, you know, um, because I told her, I go, it's a very unique gravestone. Many people look at like stop and look at it. I just want to know the story. I want to know about your son. I want to hear his history. She started telling me all about him and told me about how he loved music from a young age and about how when he was a teenager, he actually played in a band when he was underage and they would go to bars and they would place his drum set really close to the exit. Mm -hmm. So in case the bar got raided, then he could make a beeline out the back, wouldn't get caught for being underage in a bar. Um, but he later transitioned this love of music or his passion for music into a career. He became a DJ, he worked with RuPaul, um, other artists, and he later founded his own company, Disc Drive Records. So this is located on, um, his located on his grave but she just told me all this history and like she's crying i'm crying um it was it just was so it's it still remains like one of the best couple of days of my career at oakland it's just being able to talk with this woman about her son and now we tell his story on one of our special topic tours so the music makers of oakland tour all right so Wrapping up, because <laughs> I know we're getting close to, we're getting a little after one. Um, we have, so I mean, Oakland, again, I've only scratched the surface today of what we do at the cemetery. I work with an incredible group of people to help bring this history to life. And we do this through a number of different ways from tours to special events to workshops. But I want to tell you about how y'all can, you know, come to Oakland. So what's coming up is uh, we next is our Sunday in the park, and this is going to be on September 25th. But this is an all-day festival. It's a our kind of Victorian street festival, and um, we're going to have bands playing, um, vendors, food trucks, things like that, and a lot of people. I always get like you're having a concert at the cemetery. What are you thinking? Well, we do this for a number of reasons. One, Oakland was founded with no perpetual care endowment. So those Victorians who bought lots back in the 1800s, they thought, hey, I go and take care of my parents' grave sites. I go and take care of my grandparents' grave sites. My descendants are going to do that for me 100, 200, 300 years from now. We know, I mean, that's still in the case in some cultures, but has very much fell out of fashion. Um, so Oakland fell into disrepair in the early 20th century. And ultimately that's what led to the foundation or the creation of the historic Oakland Foundation, which is the nonprofit that I work for in 1976. So we work as co-stewards with the city of Atlanta. Um, so we do this one to raise money, for the continued restoration of the cemetery. But we also do this because we're doing exactly what the Victorians intended. 
we're using this space not only as a burial space, but also as a public park. Another event we have coming up, for any of you runners out there or walkers, uh, we have our Run Like Hell 5K, which is going to be October 8th. Costumes are encouraged, um, but it's a great, we did it virtually a couple years ago. I don't think we'll do that again, <laughs> but it was um, a great fundraiser again for the foundation. Our biggest event, the Capturing the Spirit of o Oakland Halloween Tours. Tickets are on sale now for members, and then they go on sale July 15th to the general public. So if you're interested, get your tickets immediately because they were they're going to all be snapped up. We have about a thousand people come through a night. And then this is my favorite. Uh, this is my favorite program. This is Victorian Holiday. So this is going to be the first weekend in December, December 3rd and 4th, but we um, we have kind of an artist market. There's a greenery and wreath sale. It's a free event, but you can come and uh, visit some of the mausoleums, which are going to be opened and decorated for the holidays. We call it our holiday tour of eternal homes. So there is no pun that we will not take advantage of. Um, and you can even get your picture with uh, St. Nicholas which I don't know if you can catch the family resemblance, but that's my dad right there. So I will actually credit him. The very first time I went to Oakland was because of my dad. I grew up in Atlanta, but like many people who come to Oakland, I had not, you know, had not ever been to Oakland. And one day for Father's Day, my dad wanted to go to Six Feet Under, which is the restaurant right across the street from Oakland. And it was, of course, Father's Day. It's busy, it's packed. So he said, he's like, let's go, let's go across the street. Let's go see Bobby. And I was like, ugh, sanitary. No, absolutely not. Of course, now I work there and now I make him be our Santa Claus. So full circle. Um, but these are some of the events that we have coming up. That's our website up at the top, oaklandcemetery.com. We have tours every single weekend, um, guided walking tours. You can come in and do the sights, symbols, and stories of Oakland. That's kind of like our greatest hits of the cemetery. Um, or we have a special topic tour. So for this weekend, I know our Saturday special topic tour is epitaphs, and then Sunday's special topic tour is about the Jewish grounds. And then of course, our special events coming up. Um, but this is my email address. If you have any questions or wanna book a tour, this is how you can get in touch with me. Of course, I've got rat cards, business cards up at the front. Um, so yeah, that's, thank you so much for listening today. Does anybody have any questions that I can answer? Yes. So. Who's got access to the last 15,000 funds? <laughs> you too can get on a wait list at Oakland. Um, basically, we have uh, Sam Reed as our sexton. He's a city of Atlanta official, but he basically works as a middleman between buyers and sellers. So all the lots are sold out, but remember, there's still individual spaces that are left. So for some families that have like died out, moved away, or they just want to monetize that space, they can sell it back to the cemetery and then um, you can buy a plot. So we do have a wait list. It's usually a couple years. Um, I've heard that starting at about $5,000 for a plot. Of course, if you are a mayor of Atlanta, we have 28. If you're a governor of Georgia, we've got six. Or if you uh, have a whole lot of money and you want to give it to the city of Atlanta, I'm sure you can jump to the top of the wait list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? And so if I was doing history and I was trying to track some people, mm -hmm. do you have an active database that allows anybody else to find names? Physically, yes. We do have the records at the visitor center. We do not have it available online just yet. We are going to be working over the next couple of years to build out a GIS database that will then be open to the public. But we're still in the planning phases of that. I'm kind of curious to the patients of the cemetery. Mm -hmm. We've got the monitor and the railroad, which is the railroad line you can see at South Atlanta, Battle Fall. Mm -hmm. Was the cemetery damaged? Number two, when did they finish cleaning up the tornado? That's a great question. So, in terms of Civil War damage, the Atlanta rolling mill 
which um, was a munitions manufacturing site. That was just to the northeast of Oakland. It's where present day, like the Fulton Cotton and Bag Mill lots are in Cabbage Town. Well, uh, when the Confederate Army was retreating from Atlanta, they took all these like train cars and munitions cars, packed them full of stuff, lit them on fire rather than let that fall into the approaching Union Army. And those explosions could be heard from miles away. But a lot of that, you know, the shrapnel landed in the cemetery up until, you know, up until a few decades ago, people were still finding like little metal pieces in Potter's Field. Um, we know, I can't really say about like damage done by Union soldiers to um, Oakland. I've heard like bits and pieces, but that hasn't been something that we've explored at length. Uh, but then a couple, so that's kind of the Civil War. And then in 2008, March 